Good evening, my name is Liam Ferry and I'm associated with the museum here and I'm very much thankful for the museum. Oh, that's the same thing. Centuries. It's not loud. 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 Come on, sweetie, for fuck's sake. The technology has passed me by. Oh, yes, yes. Here we go, Neef. Put it in. Can you hear me now? No, I don't. Is that Apple or Android? Oh. <laughs> Hello. Is that any better? Just go ahead. You're great. Yeah, you're, you're fine. Sorry for that. I'm not sure what the problem is. Go on. Uh, so, um, um, good evening, and you're all very welcome. Um, my name is Liam Ferry. I'm associated with the museum and spent 20 years with digital. Um, Brendan has asked me to just to introduce him so that he can plead with you to help us here in the museum because we think we're doing great work and uh, it's a very popular attraction and it's got a lot of attention. So, and you're great, Brendan. Thank, thanks, Liam. And uh, it's great, great to see so many uh, faces from the good old days, as we call them. And also, I'd like to give due recognition to my CEO here, Ollie Daniels, uh, uh, former Norton Telecom, former Nortel, former Avaya. And it's great to see that companies like DEC and uh, Norton Telecom are still with us. The names may have changed, but they're still with us at so many different levels, both in terms of the people that um, uh, they have gone through it and set up their own companies and are still involved in what we used to call industry and business at so many levels right across the country or in education like myself and Polly. So my name is Brennan Smith. I first came to Galway in 1975 and I finally finished the university in 1981. It's not that I was failing exams, but I got very involved in the actual students' unions. And I remember as, a, as a, um, the auditor and vice auditor of History SOC, we went to companies in Galway to get funds, the, the Irish companies, and nobody would give us money to sponsor this event or that event. And we'd go to the Northern Telecoms, we'd go to Thermo Kings, and we'd go to Digital, and they gave us money. There was very much a social awareness ethos that people like me as young students could actually feel that we never got from the Irish indigenous companies themselves. So before we get into the detail of the computer museum, I'd like to just give you a small trip down memory lane. And we're all in the same boat. We're of that same generation, except for a few in the back. Sorry, lads. <laughs> and then I'll ask Ali to say some words. So uh, pre-1970 Ireland, when we look at what we grew up, or most of us here, it felt like a totally different country. This was where people like me, at least my, my cousins, my mom and dad actually came from. Uh, this was a classrooms that were, so many of us actually went through school on. And what, looking back in the photographs of old to the schools of today, and I do a lot of work in schools through my work at Insight, and uh, I find that the schools, classrooms are alive with colour and activities. And if you look at the days that, uh, that we grew up with, uh, um, the walls were exceptionally bare. It really summarised the education at so many levels. Great at so many levels, but in terms of, of a holistic approach and mixing um, arts and sciences, it just wasn't really there itself. These children are barefoot in the front row. And this photograph is from 1967. Does anybody recognize that photograph? It's just outside Galway City, Carnmore. So it's late as 67, on the edge of Galway City, children were going barefoot to school. But it wasn't a sign of poverty. The brogue, you kind of kicked it off as soon as the summer came. It was warm. It was not considered a sign of poverty. But that was where the airport was and, well, used to be. The Corpus Christi procession, I mean, the big parades in the old days were very much religious parades. And this is what we used to call Moon's Corner passing. And you can see this is from the 1960s. UCG is quite prominent there, just under uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, the stations, uh, the big event for a lot of us living in the countryside was the stations. Your house, if it was picked for the occasion, you, you brought out the best crockery, the best delf, and you brought the priests, and there was always quite a few of them, into the front room. And it was a big occasion in, in a country area. It was a, very much a community thing. And there were some of the attendees. This is not my house, actually. This is <laughs> and the Magdalene laundries. When I came to Galway, and for most of you that weren't from Galway that came, the laundries 
were still there in the in the seventies. When did they close? In the nineties or something like that. You know, they were still there for a very long time. And the family farm. I was living. I was born in um, just off Trinity, uh, near the docks, at, uh, just off Pier Street and Macken Street. But we used to spend the summers working either up in Monaghan uh, with my mother's family um, in the harvest time, or in the bogs with my father's family in, from County Offaly. You know, and this is a lovely photograph. Um, sorry. Uh, if you look at this, it, there was a kind of, um, not everything about the past uh, was, uh, was, was bad, and I don't want to romanticize the past in any way, because there's nothing romantic about poverty, as I say. But this is a photograph from about 73, and it very much captures a moment in time that sadly is no longer with us, the family farm. The postman, before we had the internet or the web, this was the important way that we stayed in contact with the, with the world. Uh, the postman, we always uh, waited for that parcel to come in for those of us that have family working abroad in America uh, with clothes or, or money or whatever coming from the stateside in many cases. But change was happening just in the late 60s, just and digital and Northern Telecom was very much part of that, you know. So this was from um, uh, Lock Grade Vocational School. So you can see the lad's hair is getting longer and the girls' uh, skirts are getting shorter, you know, so it was a two-way process, you know, because we were always open. For people that say that we weren't open to outside influences was so wrong that the Beatles, the Ro Rolling Stones, all of that, we were very much part of that. And this was modern uh, communications as it was in the 70s. This is the Ballon the Slow telephone exchange from about 72 or so. And this was Galway. You, anybody recognize it? I'm sure lots of you do. <coughs> Where is it and what is it? Ballybridge One, yeah. Exactly, oh, Ballybridge One, and it was just on what was the edge of the city. And you could see that photograph alone summarizes how much has actually changed within the, what is now the city area itself, you know. And again, we became very much part of, of, of a global village. And it was, uh, Chandra, where are you? No. Yes. It, uh, lots of people in Galway today think that the global village in Galway really only happened in the last 20 years. But it was people like you, Chandra, coming in. You came 30 years ago, didn't you? What? 88. October 88. Exactly, exactly. exactly. That there were people yeah, from so India cool. here. There were people from Chile here. There were people from Canada here. And lots of those people had no connection whatsoever with um, Galway. So there were people that were turning from abroad, uh, from the Irish diaspora. Uh, to, Tom, is Tom here now? Tom Frowley came back from the States. Lee, where were you working? London. London. Frank, is Frank here? Frank came back from Marconi in America. So it was definitely the immigration, um, the trail of people moving was going in reverse itself, you know. And again, we became Galway, and there's still, uh, I think, uh, Dermot Keeney, where's Dermot? Yeah. You yeah. still have some of those boxes, do you? Well, yeah, I yeah. think so, yeah. There's yeah, a particular yeah. box that you have. Oh, that's right. Tony, yeah. if you want to mention what it is, it's a special one. Tell what it is. Oh, yeah. The Christmas one. Yeah, it was a Christmas uh, hamper box, but it's actually Tony Tynan's <laughs> <laughs> originally. So. Tony, Tony, could you Tony. tell us what that box is? Uh, well, it says a lot. Um, I, uh, it looks like... Um, almost like a six foot cabinet, um, the, tall, the tall box. But the smaller boxes were used, as Jim had said afterwards, for the Christmas turkeys type yeah. thing. And I believe we have one still. It just happened out that way. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, to give out a box at Christmas to the staff, oh, yeah. Yeah. it was remember, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, and you got your, I think your pudding and your turkey and all That's of those right. things. Yeah. And, and you still, because- And you got the turkeys yeah, separately, yeah. 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 And, and that was, uh, one uh, certainly wouldn't get in the civil service or in the teaching profession or anything like that. But to think about the amount of exports that were coming from Galway in boxes like that, skilled workforce, and women were slowly coming into the workforce at the higher level, like uh, as you can see here. Uh, but at the lower, that would have been very much uh, uh, women, the workforce on the, on the, what we used to call the shop floor. Uh, that was taken at the grand official opening of deck which was, I think, was it officially opened in 72? And it was opened by Bishop Brown. And again, we all remember Bishop Brown, actually, for better for us. But lovely man. Uh, lovely man, yes. <laughs> but I tell you, I was belted a few times by him, uh, verbally anyway, you know, and his successor. But the, the actual, there was nothing like that in indigenous <coughs> Ireland industry at that particular time. And that looks so futuristic. It was unbelievable. But I remember a few years ago, 
Um, one of your former um, um, colleagues from DEC, as opposed to Northern Telecom, uh, <coughs> said to me that uh, he got a phone call one day in DEC from a, a, a nun, a principal of a school in Galway City, a secondary school, and she wanted to bring her leave insert girls up to have a look because they heard that DEC were doing school tours. And she wanted, it was September, and she wanted to bring the girls to leave insert class up to, show, um, to let them see this place that everybody was talking about. And um, they came up and they were really impressed. Uh, this guy was telling me and they showed them around and they showed them the clean state and showing them the future coming through computers. Um, and the social club that was mentioned, everything like that. It was all positive news. And after about an hour and a half, they returned to the foyer and deck. And uh, he thanked the nun and she thanked him. And she gathered the girls around where they were waiting for transport. She said, girls, come, come towards me. What have you learned from this trip today? And some said that computers were the future and so on. Some saying other positive things. No, girls. What you should have learned about this trip, that unless you could... could way back in the early 70s. Yeah. Yeah. But remember you were saying, you were looking at the pictures and you were talking to Tom beside <coughs> you from Declan Europe and you were saying, where are the women? Exactly. Well, there, there were very few. You were the uh, only one. I mean, one. I worked in London yeah. originally. It was my first job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So computers was very few of us around at the time. Yeah. There was you and there was me working together. Tom was in the opposition. The dreaded Declan Europe. Myself and Pat worked um, with Professor Eddie O'Kelly and Jimmy Brown. We worked at the CAM Computer Center. And uh, we, Tommy Tyrrell, where's Tommy? He was selling us a new innovative piece of software that was uh, developed by Terry Poole, wasn't it, uh, Tom? And it was called Tabs. And it was the total yeah, total integrated business system. <laughs> and it was uh, the purchase ledger, sales ledger, the whole piece of software worked very much together. And Apple, I was Apple's first salesperson of the year back in 1982. And what made Apple successful was that the first tabletop computers fully assembled came in in 1977. You had three, the Tandy, and they had the Radio Shack stores, if you remember. Uh, you had Commodore Pet and the dreaded Declan Europe were selling really hot and going <laughs> and all over the West. And there was Apple. And uh, what made Apple successful for the small businesses, as opposed to the big business that had uh, the IBM or they had Tech, yeah. was physical, visual calculation, mm -hmm. that electronic spreadsheet that was really a, a game changer uh, for, uh, for bringing a computer, laptop, sorry, tabletop computers from uh, the hobbyists that assembled them together through the post uh, to the to the professional uh, people using them, you know. But again, I think that very much summarizes the split between men and women, actually, you know. Also, also the city, uh, oh, I remember when we came to college, we would have been 78 and trying to get our first mortgage. And your husband? Yes, Ronnie. Ronnie Anderson from Northern, Northern Telecom, yeah. yeah. Northern Telecom at the time. Um, <coughs> but um, uh, we were trying to get our first mortgage and they wouldn't consider my income. Um, because my label was like systems analyst or computer programmer and the bank said no 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 if she was a nurse or um, a teacher or something like that we can say so I mean, what is a like systems a analyst yeah, nobody knew it was a you know non-existent occupation yeah. Why didn't you say you were a nurse? And there would have been no problem. <laughs> but the, interestingly enough, when I in my last year in college, uh, some friends of mine, uh, female friends, couldn't get a loan from the bank. And I said, why? And they were saying the bank manager was telling them, you're going to get married and pregnant. What are you looking for a loan for? Because <laughs> how can you repay it? Like, you know, and uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on your husband to be. And, I mean, this was, you know, and this was very, from a very progressive um, um, uh, bank in, in Galway at that particular time, you know. Um, so, uh, so stop me at any time when we're going through this. So I was looking at the employment benefits that came from the deaths in the Northern Telecoms, good salaries, clean work environment, and trust me, as a student, I worked in some dirty factories, horrible toilets, you can imagine looking back on it, uh, voluntary health insurance, social club, family events, tops of the town, uh, company newsletter. Um, Ollie Daniels, Ollie, did you, those things, what did you have from that? within Northern Telecom? I, I think they were, you know, I think they're pretty standard. The, yeah. um, the North American, and, and people probably forget, Nortel was actually a Canadian company. So yes, yeah. it, it was very much, I, I think, very high-end engineering um, at, at management level. They pushed the kind of design end of it, which was great. Um, but 
a lot of the, a lot of the same benefits. I mean, taxis home. Yeah. We, you know, Nortel originally was predominantly manufacturing. Um, you know, you, you had finance, you had some IT support, HR, and so on. But it was a big shop floor, um, systems house, yeah. and making telephones. Uh, but one of the big things was, you know, people got a taxi home if they worked overtime, oh, if they got their tea, you know, this kind of thing. And I, I actually met somebody recently. She was work, she was working in a in a car parts. I went in to get something for my car, and I met her, and she said, you know, thirty years later, she said, I never worked in a job like it since. Yeah. You know, the, there were. Perks, Pro, not just perks, but pro progressive in terms of yeah. realizing if you had a happy workforce, yeah. you know, it's much more likely to, that you were going to get people to, to stay on and work. And you know, signs by Absolutely. some of the people that are here are still working for Nortel yeah. Yeah. or yeah. now a via yeah. 30 yeah. years later. And, and that's great. Is Pat Lawless here? No, no, okay. I, he was supposed to be here and uh, and representing via uh, 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 that level, and he became a, he was one of the students of two of the people involved in the computer museum. So there's no doubt. I mean, when I say this, uh, it's definitely not the telecom all that particular level. And you and me, Ollie, were involved in eighty one, sorry, eighty two, setting up an arts for the workplace, and we had artists come like. Um, uh, our friend from Northern Ireland, his name just escapes in moment. We used to bring artists to Galway, like poets uh, Paul Durkin Patrick and, McCabe, uh, and sorry, Patrick McCabe came in and spoke yes. to us. Yeah, so we went from in. what we used to call factories, bringing mm. the art into the workplace at the time, and mm. there was it was very positive type development. And one of the companies that was involved in that is represented today by Philip. Uh, Philip, you worked with what company? It used to be known as the Graduates Factory. Information Sources. Uh, uh, known as Graduate Factory. It uh, was based at number uh, 13, Review Industrial Estate, and from 1982 to its closure in 1985. And it was, uh, I suppose it's been described as the internet before its time. Absolutely. There were 121 graduates in there. Uh, from the RTC and UCG. RTC, yeah. uh, 12, <coughs> mostly from UCG, RTC, but uh, from other universities around Ireland and England. And they were creating abstracts on paper of uh, every article in a mag of, of 400 magazines week. that were available in American library shelves. Yeah. And they were then uh, typed into a computer, a Zenit Z89, uh, of which we have one in the museum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were 42 of them. And they arrived in Ireland. And, uh, I got involved. I was just going to got the job, I was told, there's 40... 42 of these computers coming, and you look after them. So I said I was up for a challenge. And I had a great, I built uh, a lot of learning on the job, etc. Yeah. But so it was a great I, place to work. Absolutely. And Brendan, I, I smiled there earlier when Brendan I brought back a memory of um, arts in the workplace. Remember the famous canteen at the back? Yeah. yeah. This was uh, uh, the road, across the road from, the bed, yeah. from Northern Telecom, where our yeah. neighbours and mm -hmm. digital. Joyce McCreevy. Uh, with, with the the thought, you know? mm -hmm. And what we had, what we actually were creating was a digital search specifically for libraries in America. And summarize them, <laughs> but they were the big two. And I, I wasn't one of those guys that was doing those magazines, <laughs> just to put it in the context. So it was very, we, we had a good social club. And there was, they used to call it the graduates graveyard as well. Because I was, uh, I finished with CAM because uh, uh, I had a job permit at home in a year's time at, at Carrick Cross. So I had a year to spare. So I ended up working in the factory, but unfortunately under Gemma Hussey, the cuts came in education, so my job disappeared before it actually was created, you know. So if we look at the actual layout, it's very, um, very modern now, when you compare that back in the 80s to what we have today, you know. And it was open day, as I said, like earlier with the, the nun and the, and the, 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 the actual uh, senior class leaving cert from from one of the conference schools in Galway. So to have outsiders coming in, looking at your workplace was considered, well, you don't want people, outsiders coming in, but they did and they had the open port. Who knows, who knows this picture and what it represents? The back 780, the first back yeah, 780. Yeah, 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 and that was 1978, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, so There weren't something. a lot of women uh, in, in that picture on the engineering side, and uh, the uh, yeah, most of that was a uh, um, uh, male text. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I remember I I when I I did physics in UCG and then I went up to uh, Kevin Street to do a, a masters. Yeah, yeah, Kevin Street. And and they didn't have their own masters, but I got it out of the University of Salford. Yeah. 
But I remember Digital coming in and they hired the two electronics classes, SWE, which was the engineer, electrical engineering, and WRTT, which is the telecom. The they hired the, both wow. classes back to Galway. Yeah. I mean, that's where um, Joe Hurley and Kieran Family oh, and all, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you had a newsletter, which uh, for the workplace was most unusual <coughs> digital contact news. Yeah, that was. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't involved with that yeah. uh, as they, such, you know. It was, it was HR usually produced that. Yeah, you know? but they, they were producing a magazine, and that, that was fantastic, actually. So, 78, I should recognize it from the hair, the white shirt uh, top, and the bell bottom jeans type that yeah. some are wearing, actually. You can you can really tell a picture from, from the clothing, you know. And of course, Tops in the Town like was a big thing for, for workplaces, including the post office and um, uh, Telecom Erin and so on. So, that, that was. Big and um, I was hoping Redmond Burke would come today because uh, when I looked at the factories, um, the amount, the the actual increase in, in the nightclubs of Galway, it was financed by people that had had extra income, a car, <laughs> could park outside places like Twigs nightclub. And I work every week in the um, what is the direct provision centre, which is now Twigs. And um, I, I, I there about two years ago. We it's, if you ever go in there, it looks like a trip back in time. The layout, the bar. The bar we turned into a library for the residents, you know. And we, two years ago, dismantled the old seating. You know those seating that was kind of like carpet full of drink? If you squeezed it, you could fill a barrel even today from all the drink in it. But we took all the carpet covers off them and converted them into garden furniture, you know. But I remember Redmond work. I was telling him, Red called in here. Um, he was giving us a meeting that's there inside. And I said, listen, I'm sorry, Red. I have to go now. But I'm going to a place, because I, I was working, that was a Friday, I said, I'm working in the uh, place that you used to visit, um, and it's Twigs. I said, oh, Jesus, it was pop Chris Williams was the DJ at the time. And he said, yeah, not only what, did I actually go there, he said, that, he said that's where I met my wife. Uh, the two of them were actually part of that Twigs <coughs> culture, you know? And then the barbecues that we used to have. Now, notice all the photographs I'm showing at the moment, Ollie and everybody else from NT, they're from digital. We don't have a lot of material from Northern Telecom. And that's one of the reasons why we have this event tonight. We'd love to tap into hardware, um, iconic systems, like I was hoping Kieran O'Gorman would be here tonight. He said he was working on the last um, production line for the, you know, the hand operated phone. And you can see we have a telephone box going inside. But we'd love to collect photographs, stories, <coughs> and, um, we hope to have an intern starting in January that will be building up a profile of people. Mary um, Halpin, isn't it, Ollie? Mary Theresa Hanley. Hanley, my fault, Hanley. Um, that hopefully will be recording those stories because this you is. You can write a few of them, by the way, yourself. Yeah. You Sorry? <laughs> you can write a few yourself. So <laughs> consulting but, anybody. Yeah, but the stories, the hardware, I mean, it's going to be a lost history unless we start recording it. And it's a beautiful history that we should all be proud of, you know? from people like yourselves working in, in, in the factories, uh, the people involved in education at the time, like Tom and, and Frank, and people like Pat and myself and uh, Ron. So Ron at the back now is, is in uh, myself and yourself, we used to go around the country selling apples, didn't we? <laughs> and that was, that was good fun. And there was, uh, I remember Ron, we installed an Apple computer with the Fitzgeralds in anatomy, and they didn't want to get a Professor Fitzgerald and Dr. Fitzgerald. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, but Mary Pat gave it was her. She's a friend of ours. She was the daughter. So what happened was it was so funny. He didn't want it, and he felt this was a use of a waste of money. It was about two thousand or something, which was a lot of money uh, even then. And he rang us up one day and told us that it wasn't working. It was a useless piece of equipment, and he wanted it basically out if we couldn't get it working. So we went up, and he was a professor with his wife, the doctor, and um, he said it's plugged in, but it isn't working. But there was this on-off switch at the back that he had never saw, so we had to <laughs> tell him nicely without insulting him. That actually, that's the problem, actually, itself, you know. So, and then we look at modern um, the university expansion, and we were part of that. Some of us, the regional tech came in 1972, and that's where a lot of technicians came from. Are there any people that went through RTC that went into? Of course, Coleman and uh, Tommy, yes, exactly. And Tommy, you went out on your own. You had that brilliant piece of software, um, TAPS, way ahead of his time. I, I would have gone to Dublin first, working for Mary Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Years, 
Yeah. And you went on your own, yeah. And you brought me to you brought me off to a big sales conference on taps in early eighties. I think that More was more like a drinking session. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. I was going to say that part, you know. So there's, 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 there's stories that we don't want to tell, <laughs> as well as the stories that we need to tell, you know. And Coleman, how did you get involved? What your story? I'm just, um, Not your personal life now, your work story. And, uh, but RTC was such an integral part of that whole more technical orient uh, careers uh, and our skill sets that we needed. And, and places like uh, New Merview, I was recently there two weeks ago, I was at the 50th anniversary of Merview schools. <laughs> and it, it, you know the schools, they're great schools that came from turned out whole uh, genre. But there's, there was two ceremonies. It's the only school in Ireland that, uh, that I know of that still has the boys are on one side and the girls on the other. And it was two separate ceremonies at the same time. So I didn't realize that. I was at the girls' side because I teach coding there. And there was a separate ceremony at the boys, St. Michael's, while the Holy Trinity. And then we met in the gym, you know, with all the pictures and so on. But we don't have many pictures from, we don't, uh, Ron, we don't have any from our time. Uh, 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 <laughs> Fair enough, that didn't help either. But also a Northern Telecom. So again, it, uh, very much the upgrading that happened to each night. International, as some of you might remember the awards. The beach that was run by, who was, uh, Ollie, who ran the beach? The beach it was Tracy. Tracy, yeah. that's Tracy, right. Yeah. And Rivellinos. Yeah, that, that became was the, the Flaherty's. That was the Flaherty's. Right, the Terry O'Flaherty. That's right. Terry and it was called after Rivellinos from the 1970 Brazilian World Cup, one of the players. You had Terzino and Pele and... Tausto and all of those and well, there's a lot of few other places there. I mean, the yeah, Hilltop, do it and Hilltop. Yeah, we had a lot of. It's interesting that the justice of the time, all dancing was in <coughs> Salt Hill. Mm. He didn't. Or that was one dance license outside of Salt Hill. It was in Fagans. Oh, My mother Fagans. used to say for. Men with a past and women with no future. That's right. Men with a past. I, I don't know, um, Ali. I never went there myself. I know. Well, I, <laughs> we, we were we were instructed not to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were right beside. You lived in San Antonio Park, just behind Twig. So maybe yeah, the, yeah. so the restless Twig night you had. Was, yeah, yeah. But those, but uh, there was a whole. Um, you know, with the Oslo Hotel. The Oslo is right. We're all the Burr Mountain. Burr Mountain. Burr Mountain. Yeah, all yeah. these places. There was a huge. That was true. Um, but I think Ollie, these ones specifically opened in the early seventies, though. I think um, the Hilltop and the Burr Mountain they might have been there for a few years. Yeah, the Lenaboy Arms as I was open. The Lenaboy opened with, the Lenaboy opened with uh, he opened under a dead person. Henry Greeley. Henry Greeley. Yeah. yeah. Lenaboy Arms was owned by the Cunninghams. In the seventies, was opened by the Cunninghams. The, the Cunninghams. Yeah. Yes. That's right. I remember Henry Greeley opening it, okay. As the Oasis. And, and Henry took over the castle then, didn't he, for a while? Jerry Twigs had the castle, really. Yeah, the castle. Yeah. And when it was Jerry's nightclub. Jerry's, that's right. The first place to have a wine bar. Well, anyway, that's probably, that's probably a separate, we should probably have a separate night. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> night <laughs> night <laughs> night. Yeah, really interesting. What we'd have is, we should have a daytime stories and nighttime stories. <laughs> the day was going out. Do you remember Pascal Tumman, who had the cellar and a number of the bars? He said he was able to gauge yeah. what, what, whether there was overtime in deck. Or North Ellen. He'd be able to gauge based on his receipts on, receipts. on a Thursday. His, the weekend would start on a Thursday for him if there was overtime. You know, and I'm sure lots of these other establishments were the same. Yeah, I was um, I was a student at the time. The only night we ever went out was Thursday night. So we used to follow your crowd around the deck in the north because we didn't have a lot of money for drink and you guys left a lot of drink behind. So it's <laughs> <laughs> nobody talking about that one actually. But there is uh, international downstairs you know and uh, again uh, it, they were pretty rough and ready and you remember you got smashed potato with a burger that was it was it was raw on the in the middle and very black on the outside actually but you had to do that to fulfill the license requirements so this remember the powder at smash you know, that was considered state-of-the-art like the more you drank the nicer it tasted actually if I remember correctly you know so that was a uh, nor that was um, International. That was the students, people like myself, out protesting houses for family, uh, for people, homes for young families. It was so funny. But not all has changed. A lot. There's uh, the shop floor on the deck again. 
again, it's all females except for one male who's the obviously supervisor. When did the big change happen in Jack? Is it? Okay, you'd yeah. remember that now. And Willie, really, there's a fantastic photograph of you. I should have had it up there. You look like a, I said to you one day, you look like a member of a rock and roll band. And you said, I was. <laughs> you, you were a guitarist. What was the name of that group you had? Okay, very. <laughs> that, was, that was the first disc drive I ever made in Ireland. It's called the Arcade 5. Oh, my, the first disc drive. Mm. Here you go. And they brought to bring it in. A lot of doubters said it. Ireland didn't have the technology to produce a disc drive. Well, we have Erla tonight, who's head of the Commodore Amiga Club, that meet here the first Friday to play all the old games like the retro games, the Space Invaders, Pac-Man, all of those. Uh, reminds me of Sea Point. And we have to, like, that's an interesting story I did know, the first disc drive, you know. So Erla's in the front row, 76. That's amazing now. But nothing, not all things changed. This is... Uh, uh, Liam, I think you brought this in. Digital, this came out in, in the Connacht uh, Telegraph newspaper in about 76 or something. And uh, look, phone Galway 2012. But it says, are you leaving school this year? If your home is the west of Ireland, why leave the west? This is an ad from the newspaper. Invest your future in digital west. Why emigrate? Now, again, may it start a career as a computer technician. Computers should have a good leave and search and fair for electronics. Uh, attractive pay and so on. We have our openings for 50 people, fantastic. But the good news is for women, we also have vacancies for young ladies, you know? <laughs> Not older women <laughs> who would be trained in components, factory floor stuff, you know? So maybe you could have got a loan um, pat in your conference. <laughs> exactly. So it's almost like a split down the middle. So it took a while. And the there's Northern Telecom. The first ad, Sorry, I saw uh, something out there. The Nortel or Northern Telecom opened in seventy three. Yeah. And the first ad in the Connacht kind of Tribune, the title yeah. the headline was Girls Wanted. Girls, not women. Not Girls females. wanted. Not men. And uh, you know if I think if they if they had that ad today there'd be a few people taking it. What was that paper in? Connacht kind of Tribune. We have a copy of it. I know oh, that you guys, uh, there's a lot of stuff was done a few years ago for uh, a kind of uh, in a reunion that took place a few years ago. And a, a lot, there was a big collection of photographs and stuff. Yes. So I think maybe we should get on yeah, yeah, to yeah, someone. Because yeah. again, there's a, there's a lot of parallels between yeah. digital and there is. Northern Telecom. There is, you know. And let's be honest. Sorry. Sorry? Uh, 1977 was when the Employment Equality Act came yeah. in. So this would have been about 76. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the girls' titles and all of those yeah. and that type yeah. of thing. So yeah. thanks, Liam, for that, because yeah. you'd be very aware of, of so, social so issues like that. Pay to men yeah. Yeah. Uh, employment Equality, which outlawed that for women. But you know what has changed as well? They had long weekends where there was no work. P.S. We're closed for June weekend from Thursday to 31st of May at 5.10 p.m. to Tuesday the 5th, you know. So they're the type of stories like when it was, you know, this type of thing was, was there and when it was not. And it was the personnel department as opposed to the HR. So this is the type of information from your good selves and the equipment. And thanks to Jerry. Is Jerry, where's Jerry? Jerry, tell everybody what you brought in tonight. Yeah, a couple of um, microboxes that um, I've picked up over the last year and they've been sitting basically doing nothing for the last couple of years at home so I thought I'd bring them. And do they work? They work fine, yeah. Exactly, and that's some great news. So we have hardware, but it's pretty deadware. But thanks to Jerry now, we should have a working um, system, and that's great. And Pat, tell what you brought in there. Oh, well, the Commodore Amiga, my kids had yeah. a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. And hundreds of games. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, which they would have got from the 80 early years. It's taking me an awful job picking my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we think of young people and games as a new phenomena, but it's been around for a oh, long time, you know, in all it. honesty. Yeah. Yeah. But I remember reading it um, back in the 60s and 70s, of the people that were doing programming, there was a high proportion of women, but people like me are to blame for the, the drop-off of women, and you, Pat, and, and, and uh, also John, uh, uh, Tom, and also Ron, because what we did was we sold computers for Christmas. And the parents bought it for the boys, like the Commodore mm -hmm. uh, Big 20s and the mm -hmm. Sinclair, never for the girls, you know. So that's when kind of the uh, separation started to happen. And Norton Telecom, we have a number of 
of these phones. And if you notice in the museum, we have um, uh, uh, a telephone box that we're making, and we have one of the old phones, press button A, press button B. And what we're doing is we're getting that working uh, using the old coins, but there'll be a Raspberry Pi inside it. So you ring a certain number and you get a story, hi, this is Northern Telecom, or this is Deck, and we're trying to do that type of story with them. And uh, there's a photograph coming up of Liam holding one of them, but um, so we're using modern technology and so on uh, to tell that. But uh, Tony, uh, your daughter, I was showing her, you remember Dermot, I showed that um, we have the, the telephone, press button A, and the, and the main piece. We got it from the college, and there's all these hand scroll names on it. And your wife mm. said to me, I said to her where I got it, and she said, oh my God, is that the phone that was outside the canteen? And your wife uh, said, uh, I said yes, and she said, oh my God, the amount of relationships I broke using that phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Uh, <laughs> Except for me. Yeah. And she said, plural, I'm sorry for that, but you heard it. I'm not telling you a secret. It was so funny, actually. So even the phones have stories, you know? And there was, you recognize the chap on the left? Carl Flannery, you know? And you recognize the phone? Yeah, exactly. It was so uh, way ahead of his time, early 80s, a visual display. And we turned it on in his house. He had it in the attic. And it just. <laughs> It just collapsed. It stopped working for two seconds after that picture was taken. You know, I don't know what's wrong with. And the yuppie, we have um, we have a phone, uh, the brick uh, at the time representing the eighties. Uh, the computer stores. There was Declan Europe represented by Tom there. The computer center represented by Ron there and Pat and O'Connor's TV. There were others, but they were the big three, I think, at the time. We were selling BBC Sinclairs in the early eighties. Uh, Sorry? We weren't allowed to sell BBCs. Yeah, what happened, Ron? We couldn't. The present government had been thrown up. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. Lenny McNally. That's right, yes. That, that we was Lendak. We only could sell uh, Acorn. Acorn Atoms, yeah. that's right, yeah. Acorn Atoms, you know. And uh, we, we ran, uh, Ron, if you remember, the first uh, computer, microcomputer teaching course for teachers in with Ollie Ryan. Yeah. And uh, using the Acorn Atoms, they had a really bad power supply mm -hmm. to use to melt. So this was an ad from Christmas, November. We were trying to sell computers for the Christmas tree at the time. Uh, Sinclair, the first computer, ZX was the processor, 81 was the year. It sold for 99, and that went like hotcakes. Yeah. And of course, Pac-Man uh, and uh, Asteroids and um, Space Invaders, all of those. The first million selling computer was the FIG-20. And the reason why it sold so, so well, uh, Jack Tremiel that founded um, Tom uh, uh, Declan, uh, or sorry, he founded Commodore Pet. He wanted to sell it for Christmas and convince the people, the uh, parents, that this was the ch the um, computer for the future for their children. So he hired a man from the future, William Shatner, <laughs> and he then convinced people uh, that this was what the children needed. That it was more than games, actually. You see. Oh, sorry, it's not transferred. I just cut. And the Apple generation, the. Uh, myself and Pat and Ron, we were part of that, and mm. I was Apple salesperson of the year. And they, uh, they, this is me with the gun on the on the on my left, and they sent me off to Morocco. And I, I was, I brought my um, girlfriend at the time, but this guy from England took a fancy to her, so that. Uh, 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 but uh, <laughs> rifle had a reason to be there. But Apple were so <laughs> advanced; they brought us to the desert in in, in Morocco, and we were brought to a big. Um, Berber tents and there were snake charmers and belly dancers and then this uh, people came in on camels and on horsebacks and the Berbers if you know them they wear they cover their faces the men do because of the sand so these people were ordering everybody around and then they took off the Berbers it was all the top executives of Apple International they really got into the whole spirit of the thing you know uh, Berb place of computing this lady uh, Maura from um, from uh, from uh, Spittle she was doing computer coding courses uh, here at the university in 71, uh, 72, using DEC equipment. They weren't connected in, but uh, they were using this equipment. First the courses came, then the computers came, well before people like me got into it. So DEC, for those who were involved in DEC, 1977, she used a PDP P8 mini computer with two teleprinters supplied by DEC. This was out in, um, in Spittle. So DEC really had a fantastic outreach program. You know? Uh, this was the first computer to go into every school, and myself and Ron and Pat were 
installing them in January onwards, and uh, uh, we were installing it in a lot of schools across the west of Ireland, and I'll never forget that some of those teachers, principals, took the computers from us and locked them in a press because they just <laughs> didn't understand computing. And we did the first course for teachers um, in November 1981 because the computers were going in in January 82, a few months later, and programming was starting to come in. And the principal said to, oh, you're the maths teacher, you're the physics teacher, you got to do this course. And genuinely, I think half of them took early retirement that year because the world had changed, the microchip <coughs> had arrived, and they, some of them, did, the older generation, didn't understand the new technology. Uh, this is um, uh, beside you, uh, Tom. This is the Mercy School back in the early 80s, giving out. Who's this man here, Tom? Do you know him? Uh, Tom? Yeah, a fellow called Frank. Uh, can't remember his second name. He was in personnel. Frank Quinn. Sorry? Frank Quinn. No. Yeah, he was married to um, Frank the assistant Frank. manager in the canteen. Was so he Quinn. was in Fulton Deck? Was, was he in Fulton Deck? He was a second employee. Yeah. And who was the man on the right? That's, <coughs> look, looks like here. Yeah. Yeah. From Deck again. Yeah, yeah. Quick tech. Well, was quick tech nowadays. Oh, quick tech. Yeah. Yes, quick tech. Yeah. Uh, but but this was uh, before quick tech. Oh yeah. This is early eighties. Yeah, so uh, for some reason, Deck was donating these um, uh, Commodore systems to to the to a local school. That's fantastic, actually. It, that's from media. And there is a young um, salesperson <laughs> introducing um, the the need to bring computers away from programming and into all subjects. You know, Brendan Smith. Office manager. I'm the guy with the hair on the right, not the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we we were really saying, look, you got to get computers into all subjects. You know, so it's so funny. That guy hasn't lost one head of hair since then. He's still got the same amount of hair, Victor, unlike the other guy. You know, uh, back in '82, and science fiction become reality. We were selling down below uh, chess uh, computer chess sets that were. Um, that had different, seven different levels for about 120, inspired by Star Trek program, made by a company called Fidelity. Um, we, it, the, the founder of Fidelity was so impressed with it, um, Spock playing uh, 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 the computer in a 72 episode of Star Trek, he decided to, to make these models. So, I mean, computer chess is considered something new. No, it was there at desktop. And Frank, that was here earlier, this is the famous uh, 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 hero computer. And if you look at it closely, it's in the museum. It's uncannily similar to RTD2 from Star Wars. This was used to teach robotics back in the early 80s. And this particular one that we have inside took part in St. Patrick's Day Parade in 1984, <laughs> you know, showing people this is the future. So AI, robotics, been a go away for a long time, you know. Community computing, we were, we were doing newsletters um, using PageMaker. Do you remember we brought in the laser printers uh, and all of that? And it suddenly, you brought, it cost about maybe six and a half thousand for the laser printer, the PageMaker software, and the Mac, but compared to the huge prices that you paid at the time for printing. So it brought printing away from the companies into the, um, into, um, the, the front room, so to speak, you know. And in schools, um, Brother Niall from the St. Pat's here, well, you, you were using, you had a suite of computers back in the early 80s using the Sinclair Spectrum, I think, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what you brought me tonight, what Niall brought me tonight was these. He has given me an old projector, and this is the last piece of the jigsaw. A few weeks ago, you brought me up to, um, to, your, to, to, the, to the patrician's house up near Taylor's Hill. And the film, I have not yet seen it because I needed it. What's on that film, the old reel-to-reels? Well, from me and the whole lot of our young fellows, yes. we were going to Patricia Fellows, our young fellows, yes. and going on to various um, scenes of others, functions and all the rest. Yes. And there's one scene where you have priests and brothers, and the whole place is fumigated with smoke. <laughs> What was the smoke? Oh, that everybody's smoking, yeah. And what years are those? Uh, the back in the late fifties, sixties, seventies, around. And so, what we're going to do, and thank you for that, all that old tapes and so on, we have to start digitizing and making available in the actual cloud, you know. Uh, and this is the UCG Computer Society. This is from nineteen eighty, and they have here. 
Tom, you'd be pleased to know, uh, Commodore Pett. And this chap here is Kevin Connolly. Some of you might know him um, with his back to us, unfortunately. And the other guy is Russell Sukrov. But you can see they have Star Trek. And what's it done? You remember those big sheets of paper that we used to print out on the spools? Colin, there he is now. What year is that? Um, there he is. 77. That is early, you know. So you haven't changed a lot. Look at him, he's no. still totally recognizable, actually. <laughs> Except for the jumpers, we don't have that anymore. <laughs> and again, there's a young man in the front row. Dermot, do you want to explain that story? That's you. Oh, well, yeah, that was. Um... It was a computer-controlled robot <clears throat> that uh, I put together in, I think it was, oh, it was 1986 or 87, actually, yeah. Um, and it was a, just a Commodore VIC-20 uh, with an interface and just connected to uh, a series of wiper motors that used to drive wheels and you could program it to go off and yeah, and you follow a path. Yeah, big twenty. Yeah, a big twenty. Basic programming was it? Yeah, basic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was a robot. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And you were exhibiting at the uh, RDS. Yeah, I entered it into the Young Scientist exhibition at the time. Yeah. Well yeah. done. So that, that was absolutely yeah. brilliant stuff, you know. And there is um, again. This is Coder Dojo back in 1982, where on Saturday mornings in Declan, Europe, they used to do programming classes with the parents and the young people. And John Cunningham brought his son there. And John, sadly for the Tribune, is no longer with us, but his son is very much still involved. So that, that was a brilliant article. Computer kids bring dads back. So we think Coder Dojo is a new phenomenon. And there it is uh, back in 82. Fantastic, you know? And online connectivity. You remember the Minitel? Yeah, and that's that's in the uh, every household uh, home in, in France got it from 82, uh, allowing us to do um, online uh, connections to our bank, to our, to our, to our, to our hotel uh, service. And this is the one that Philip was talking about earlier. This was the Google search engine had in inverted commas that we developed for the libraries um, through ISL Information Sources Limited. And just the reason why this photograph is up there, there's Granny McMurray, Ollie, and some of your friends are on the front row. Back in night, I was president, this is me here on the left, there was a guy caught hacking into the college system. He, um, what he did was, uh, he, we just call him Dermot, because that's his first name. <laughs> and Dermot, some of you might know Dermot. Okay, Dermot McDonald, what the hell? You know, what can happen to him now? And well, he was clever. He hacked into the college um, password system and he printed out um, exam results and so on and he but he made one mistake he printed it at a line terminal in um, a room far away from where he was uh, remember the computer rooms behind in the concourse one behind there and there was a security guy passing him passing and he saw this printer printing out <laughs> he saw these long reams of of whatever he wasn't fully sure what it was but he knew it at 11 o'clock at night time this shouldn't have been going on so Anyway, Dermot was caught in the act by Bobby Curran. Uh, you remember Bobby? <laughs> but, and I, he was being kicked out of college because of what he had done. This was hacking before we even knew what the word was. So I was his uh, student officer, and I pleaded that he was innocent. He didn't realize what he was doing. He was experimenting. I had no idea. Of course, it was total opposite. And I got him back into the college, actually. So it was quite funny, you know. But we had hacking at that particular time. Tony Tynan, were you involved in this? The networking of schools? Yeah. yeah. The, the early days as well. The yeah. Early days, yeah. yeah. And were you involved in that oh, as well? Yeah, yeah, very early, yeah. This was your network. Well, there are people in the room here that are qualified. Who hands up who was involved in this? The, yeah. the computers in schools. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, as a, uh, an indication of digital social responsibilities, uh, they provided a VAX. A dedicated VAX machine yeah, in, the art, yeah. in the computer room, and they put in uh, a terminal in every secondary school in Galway. Except one. Yes? Only one secondary school. If you look here, you'll see Taylor's Hill, St. Ignatius, the Jazz, St. Joseph's, Salerno, um, and so on. Well, St. Ignatius is a very special case because they had digital equipment many years before that, That's courtesy true. of a man called Kevin Peary. Yes. A Kevin, genius. yes, he's still around with us. He, he used to use... Um, Whose uh, book would you own in your election? Or Liam? Yeah, yeah Liam, yeah. yeah. He, 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 he took 
obsolete equipment and refurbished it and put it into the gels yeah. uh, and with terminals. So they were ahead of the game. Yeah. And this was cloud computing, really, wasn't it? Yeah. It was stored in the server in deck. Yeah. Now, the, the, there's only one secondary school didn't take them because they felt that computers, they weren't yeah. going to last. Some them. of those schools didn't. And I'm not going to tell you what the name is. <laughs> <laughs> And you did great. And Kevin, I didn't realise Kevin was intimately involved. And Enda, you were involved in all of that. Well, at the, the very early stage, I, I did some, of the, I, I did did some of the liaison in that with, with the schools to, as a kind of... I was training manager at the time, so I was kind of oh. asked to look at that, you know. And what software were you using for the schools? Was it... I can't uh, remember now. Programming I mean, languages and Fortran, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maths. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. 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 I think they had basic, actually. I mean, uh, you were one of those students, Jerry. Yeah, I, I used the system from, I guess, when I was about 14. Yeah. And we had access to basic. Yeah, St. Mary's. Yeah. Uh, Fortran, we had C and others. So yeah. some of the more advanced students yeah. also yeah. used CLA Pascal. Um, so, so Mark, yeah. Paul, Paul Walsh. Pascal as well, Mark. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Yeah. But that's a fantastic. So there you were doing science and programming because uh, one of our retro gaming nights we had a lot of people in and three parents were there, three female parents with their children and uh, playing the Space Invaders and all of that. And three women were there together as a group and with their children and they screamed when they saw the 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 PT. Uh, Terminal there, and they said, Oh my god, we used those back in Salerno back in the 80s, you know. And I said, That's so impressive. What were you doing? Was it Fortran? What, what was it? You know, we weren't doing anything like that. We, the girls who were chatting up the boys in St. Mary's, who were chatting up the girls in, in, uh, in Taylor's Hill, because you had fax mail. So this was online <laughs> social media before the rest of the world knew about it, you know. That was, you know, so there was the them using it for social. Uh, interconnectivity. So, uh, were you, who, which girls were you chatting up, um, Jerry? Oh, boys, would you? Sorry, go on. The boys chatting up the girls. I was going to the jazz at the time. Yeah. And um, a friend of mine uh, was going out with a girl to learn. And I asked him, uh, so he, he ended up with an email address in jazz, and he was. Email and his uh, girlfriend oh. in Salerno. So then I started sharing the email account with him and got in touch with the girl in Salerno. Yeah. And uh, I, I ended up marrying him. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Well done. <laughs> no, we definitely have to capture those stories. I mean, this was something. I mean, on, when did Facebook come out? 1998 or something? That, that's extraordinary. And what year was that? 85. 85. That's, uh, that is unbelievable. Yeah, computer dating back then, you know, mm -hmm. extraordinary. Brendan, yes. Before you leave that. Sorry, my fault. In the um, <laughs> the mid sixties, my father was a maths teacher in Bish. Yes. And he found. What was his name? Ty McCrohan. Ty McCrohan. Okay. And he um, he found the computer society in the Bish at the time, and we used to get um, get us writing bits of Fortran, and he bring the. The written up sheets yeah. up to UCG and get them entered in the following week to come back with the results. And that was in the 60s? That was uh, mid 60s. Yeah, that's extraordinary. You know. So you'd write them down, you'd bring them up to, to the university. You, had, you know the big programming yeah. sheets? Yeah, yeah, the big yeah. programming yeah, sheets. Absolutely. That, that's extraordinary. Yeah, the 1800. Yeah. The, the 1800. Yeah. Yeah. John Finnegan, that's right. They named a boat after him, Finnegan's there was, Wake. You know? There was an ICL before that. Sorry, there was what? An ICL, an ICL before, before that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there you go. The that's the one in Turbo, I think, in Turbo. Yeah, yeah. That, was yeah. yeah. That, that, that is, that is yeah. amazing, you know. And uh, I remember about the same time, Joe Shocktoncy was in the Bish, and they invented, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, remember the Gestetners? Uh, he didn't invent the Gestetners, but you know how the Gestetner worked, the spongy sheets, the, um, the ink, the, the hollow drum. And they got, uh, um, they got um, cotton sheets soaked in ink, and they use a roller um, pin, you know, to, to actually 
use that as a kind of a stencil, and they used to do their own uh, Bish newsletter. So that thing, that is amazing. I didn't know there was anything like that going on that linked into um, uh, John, was it John Finnegan again? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I, I remember him vaguely, I didn't do it. And this is the, um, the type of thermals that you were using. I think the first one were really what we call dumb thermals, weren't they? And the, 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 the uh, lean, wasn't it? And the intelligent ones came later. We're, we're coming to the second say. one, video 5 was the first one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the other ones that I think you were giving out to the schools uh, for understandable reasons, you know. And there is uh, Liam in the back. I remember I was telling about the phone boxes. Mm -hmm. Now, Liam, when he worked in deck, he obviously had a few drinks one night and he took a phone from one of the kiosks around town. You, st you, you donated that, didn't you, Liam? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, sure. I left it in the garden shed and I mother uploaded it on Lee many years later. <laughs> So <laughs> we have that as a backup, uh, so we do actually, you know, that's good. And of course, video did you, conferencing. Uh, did you graduate to ATMs early on, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a fantastic picture. And get where is it, that picture taken? Telecom, no, no, Telecom no, exactly. No, no, so, no. And do you re uh, wasn't it the first video conferencing took place between Dublin and Galway in 87 or 89? You remember that, and that was launched by um, Charles High. The connection was made with Charles J. High as Taoiseach at the time. So again, video conferencing in Galway back in the 80s. And I think digital demand at that facility would be there, didn't they, I think, if I remember serves me correct. For actually. bandwidth, yeah. Yeah, for the bandwidth, you know. Oh yeah, no, no problem. Yeah. So we're coming to the end. So back to the future is where we're all at. And uh, I'll finish up with this one. This is, um, you know, who, the, who they are, the Burks. And, uh, and a few years ago, um, Red was in and he was taking photographs and he made these beautiful um, paintings. And he also did it up in Marconi Station out in, um, uh, what was the Marconi Station out in um, near Clifton. So we're hoping to have an exhibition of his artwork inspired because usually digital art is using digital technology for art, but his theme is digital, you know? So anyway, that's kind of a, a true for time memory lane. And what we'd love to get from people tonight, we have sheets here, and we'd love you to give your name if you want to stay involved, your former workplace, your email address, and your interest in volunteering. Because what we need to do is have this museum open on a more permanent basis, probably over the weekends. Uh, we need guides from yourself. We need a digital makers club that can help us repair the equipment. We need the photographs, and we don't have any really from Northern Telecom or Nortel uh, of that whole area. And uh, yeah, so basically that's a summary. This is your home as much as it is myself and Phillips and Liam's and Tom's and other people here involved in the Computer Museum in Erla. And we need your involvement um, because I was in Bletchley Park and I, I there a few months ago, and I saw how Bletchley Park now is a huge tourism attraction, but it was inspired by a group of people that used to use those great ICL systems and others came together and their legacy now is a strong one. And I think your generation deserves a permanent legacy. The stories have to be written, the computer equipment has to be maintained, and the communications equipment. So anyway, that's a kind of an overview. Um, there is a computer museum in Bletchley Park. There is. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. what it was so inspiring. It's, yeah. it's within this great um, World War Combo. II enigma. Yeah and all of that, but you're right, it's a separate entity, you know, and yeah, so on. Yeah. So, Ali, maybe you'd like to say something? Sure, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> no problem. Uh, you know, first of all, Brendan, thank you, as always. I think um, without your uh, passion and drive and your ability to connect people, it would be very difficult to see the museum being maintained at all. I know you, you're a classic radiator, but you also get energy from people like Liam uh, and Frank and others that have helped you I mean, one of the things that I suppose that needs to be captured as well, as well as the actual uh, technology, which is really interesting, is I think the impact of the introduction of that technology to um, go away. And, you know, there's guys here like Dave and, and Tom and Frank from Nortel and, and, you know, Ronnie is here in spirit, I know, from, from Nortel as well. And all the guys, you know, when we were going up, digital was the place to go. Digital was this new, the future. It had started and lots of kids in college we're seeing this as an alternative. And then the likes of the Nortels and other places that have come. But I, I think the impact, the kind of the change in attitude, a lot of the, the let's call it the leaders in those organizations, um, 
wore a green jersey underneath whatever their, their digital vest or their Nortel vest or whatever it was and brought in, fought to bring in the next generation. So they weren't happy with it just being manufacturing. They wanted to get their hands on the, the next, the development. So if, if, you know, certainly in my case, when we looked at guys like Len Gaffney, who went over to, to Canada and fought for the, and, and, you know, challenged the people over there to say, we can do more than just manufacturing. We can actually, um, you know, design things here as well and give us a piece and we go and get another piece. And, and that, over time, you know, the, this research center for, for, in, for me is the next generation of what was started by those pioneers in digital and Northern Telecom and elsewhere. Because today, you know, when we, people talked about we're in R&D, we really we were in D, we were in the design side of it. And there wasn't enough of the research being done in places like Galway. Because if you went to the Canada or Northern or North America or whatever it was in the States, they didn't trust us. They said, you know, they're cheap, they speak English, they're very charming people, but can they really do the design work? And if you look at Avaya today as a case in point, there's five, five, nearly 600 people in Avaya today. Half of them, or 300, are working in research and development. It's huge. I mean, all the contact centre work for Nortel, or sorry, for Avaya globally, is, is headquartered out of the Merview. Aspect, Alta Cloud, Genesis, Cisco are all here, and they've all been spawned <coughs> on the gene pool. They're all ex Nortel people. So they're I think five of the top seven contact center companies in the world have, have significant presence in Galway. That's just in a space that I know well. But in, the, you know, in digital, compact, and now HP, the throughput and the creation of really bright minds and also a mindset that said, it's, we, we can do more. So whether it's young people, who, you know, male, female, whatever, to say we, we can actually take on these um, our, our counterparts and compete internally and get that work. And I think that's, you know, if I look at the Liam Ferry and his Liam, I remember living in France and crying out for, you know, this, the emigrant when it was there to find out what was happening at home. You talked about newsletters. That was the most powerful, you know, it reached so many people. And, and yet, what the biggest impact that I think the museum should do, should reflect is the introduction of these technologies opened the minds of so many people to the potential of what we could do as engineers, as designers, as young people who are willing to take on the world and, and become the new Ireland. So I think it is important to maintain the stories. I think the stories need to be more than the technology. I think it's wonderful to, uh, we'll all reminisce about, you know, as Tony Johnson's there saying, I oh, no, no, that was actually, you know, people can remember the software, they can remember the computer systems. But I also think some of the stories I'd say in conference rooms, in meeting rooms, where leaders of those various companies said, how do we get the next thing? How do we get the design of that or the testing of that system? How do we get the trust of the organization that we can do that? And I, I think that's the really important thing. Today, if you look at modern Galway, we're seeing, I was in, unfortunately, at a funeral yesterday in, in the Clada Church and the Piscatorial School next door where a hundred odd years ago, the ambition was to teach the young people about making fishing nets and how to learn to fish. Well, you know, a hundred years later, we're putting in Rent the Runway into that as a technology center for that company into the CLADA as a community. And, the only, and I think as a community group here, in telling those stories, I'd like to see our city fathers and leaders show a bit more ambition in terms of creating, you know, more, <coughs> more space for the technology companies of the future. And I also think to support and fund the museum, which we are housing an insight here because of you. No other reason. If it wasn't for Brendan Smith, you wouldn't get the support in the university and I wouldn't be allocating this space because you're worth it. And I don't mean that just in terms of people don't re realize the impact that the outreach program here, I think in the last six years, there's 1,500 schools visited across this island. Um, a lot of those are disadvantaged children that where Brendan and three other colleagues are basically going out there 
in, in a kind of an education and public engagement way. And, and you know, I, I think but it's really got to look at more of that and how do we get people involved in that. So I think we Insight will continue to support you. We'll continue to provide the space here. I think the university could be challenged to provide an even better space, but we need to make it more than, I think it needs to have more digital stories as well. So rather than just, I think we should, should find a way, if we could, Brendan, to actually digitize, to interview people and have a series of um, you know, online interviews of, with people that are here, 